In the next series of lectures, we're going to discuss the methods by which we determine the structure of proteins. Now, this topic is actually a topic that we're going to discuss in much more detail in biochemistry, but in these several lectures, we're simply going to introduce these topics. So suppose that we begin with some unknown protein. So we are given a beaker and inside that beaker we have some type of unknown protein. The question is, how exactly can we determine the composition of that protein? So which types of amino acids are found within that protein and what is the number of each one of those amino acids? So theoretically, the way that we would go about determining the composition of the protein is by destroying all the connections holding our amino acids together. And this includes the peptide bonds, the amide bonds holding individual amino acids, as well as disulfide bonds, the bonds between our cysteine amino acids. So once we break all these bonds and we separate our amino acids into their individual form, and then we separate those amino acids into individual beakers where each each beaker contains one type of amino acid and then we count up the number of amino acids in each beaker that will basically give us the ratio of one amino acid to the other that will give us the composition of our protein. Now this is in principle. How exactly can we find this experimentally? So in this lecture, we're going to discuss how by experimental basis, we can basically determine the composition of our protein. So one of the stronger bonds that hold the entire structure, the tertiary structure of our protein, as well as the quaternary structure is our disulfide bridges. So these are our disulfide bonds that exist between our cysteine molecules. So these are in fact covalent bonds. Now, the way that we form these disulfide bonds is via an oxidation reaction. So the way we break them is, well, what's the opposite of oxidation? It's reduction. So that means if we take our disulfide bond and we allow it to undergo an oxidation reaction by mixing it with some type of thiol, that cysteine bond will break. And the most common type of thiol that we use specifically in biochemistry is mercaptoethanol. So mercaptoethanol is a thiol that can be used to cleave to break our disulfide bridges. Now let's suppose our unknown protein consists of several polypeptides. So it has a quaternary structure. So if the protein has a quaternary structure and the individual peptide units that are found within that quaternary structure are, are held together by disulfide bonds, then if we apply the thiol, our mercaptoethanol, then we break down those disulfide bonds and we separate our individual peptide subunits. So let's suppose this is our protein and the protein has quaternary structure. Let's suppose it consists of two individual polypeptide chains. We have one shown in green and one shown in red or one shown in blue. The red bonds are basically our disulfide bridges. So the, the, uh, our disulfide bridges hold these two individual green and blue polypeptide chains and our disulfide bonds also hold the tertiary structure of that protein. So we have red bonds within the actual green section, we have red bonds within the actual blue section, and we also have the red bonds holding these two sections together. So in this region, we have the protein consisting of two polypeptide chains held together by our disulfide bonds shown in red. And we, when we mix it with uh, some type of thiol, for example, mercaptoethanol, we break all these red bonds, our disulfide bonds via a reduction reaction, and we form our two individual separate polypeptide chains, the green and our blue. 
So the thiol will break all our disulfide bonds and therefore separate the protein into its two individual peptides. So we have our beaker, inside that beaker we have our protein. If we mix our thiol in, we basically now have the beaker that has the, we have the beaker that consists of these two individual separate polypeptide chains. The question is, how can we separate the mixture of two polypeptide chains? So how can we take one of those polypeptides and place it into a different beaker? So we basically have to use some type of analytical technique. So we basically have to use either electrophoresis, which we already spoke about earlier, so we're not going to discuss it in detail in this lecture, or we can use some type of chromatography technique. Now the two Two common types of chromatography techniques that can be used are the gel filtration chromatography which basically separates our polypeptides based on size or the ion exchange chromatography or simply ion chromatography which separates our polypeptides based on the net charge. So let's discuss gel filtration chromatography. So we would use gel filtration chromatography only if there is a considerable difference in the size of these two polypeptides, the green and our blue one. So gel filtration chromatography involves passing the mixture of our polypeptide subunits through a column of beads and these beads have very small microscopic holes so that small peptides can basically get stuck within those small microscopic holes. As we pass our mixture through the column, smaller peptides move more slowly than the larger ones because the smaller peptides basically move into those holes and spend more time within those holes. Now, once again, this technique can only be used as long as we have a considerable difference between the size of our two proteins, our two polypeptides. Now, what if the size is pretty much the same? Well, if the size is the same, but they have different net charges, we can basically use the ion exchange chromatography technique. So this is another chromatography technique that can be used to separate our polypeptide subunits. So it separates them on the basis of their charge instead of size. Basically, what we do is the following. We take our column and we outline that column with molecules that contain functional groups that are highly charged. As the peptide subunits pass through our highly charged column, the peptides with a higher degree of net charge will spend more time binding to the column and will pass more slowly. That peptide that contains less charge will end up speeding through our column and will elute first out of our column into some beaker. And in this way, we can separate these two or we can separate this mixture of two polypeptides into two individual beakers that each contain their own polypeptide. Now the question is, what exactly do we do once we contain our two beakers and each beaker contains its own individual polypeptide subunit? Well basically now we want to hydrolyze our amino acids. We basically want to take the polypeptides, we mix them with hydronium in the presence of water and the hydrolysis reaction takes place in which we basically break our polypeptide in two our individual amino acids. So we take our two beakers that each contain the polypeptide, we hydrolyze them by mixing uh, hydronium and water, and then we basically have our two beakers that consist of simply amino acids. 
Now, because each amino acid has its own unique side chain group that contains its own unique charge, we can also separate our amino acids in each beaker by basically using the ion exchange chromatography technique. So, once again, once we separate the peptide subunits, we can break them down into their amino acids by hydrolysis, basically mixing hydronium and water. We can then determine how much of each amino acid is present by using an ion exchange chromatography. So, if we use it before, we have to use it once again. So, basically, this is what we have to do. Let's suppose we take beaker 1 that contains only this blue or this green polypeptide. Once we hydrolyze, now we contain this composition of amino acids. And we take that beaker, we dump it, we dump it into our ion exchange column, and now elution will take place. So base or elution, is that even a word? Um, eluding, I guess it will begin to elute. So, uh, we basically have the separation of our different amino acids. Let's suppose we only have three different types of amino acids in this entire polypeptide chain. So these different amino acids will have their own side chain R groups, which will carry its own charge. And that means the highly charged groups will spend more time and so will elude slower than the ones that carry less charge. So let's suppose one will spend more time and three will spend less time. So we have this beaker that contains a solution of ninhydrin. Remember, ninhydrin is a molecule that basically can be used to detect the presence of amino acids. And it turns purple when we have amino acids. Now, the uh, the more purple the color is, the more amino acids we have in our solution. So basically, as our different amino acids elute, this turns purple. The more amino acids we have, the more purple the color is. Now, by using a spectrometer, we can basically collect this information on the following graph. So the y-axis is the intensity of the color, how deep purple or light purple it is. So the more intense it is, the deeper the color of the purple, and the less intense it is, the less the color of the purple, the lighter the color of the purple is. And the x-axis is time. So basically, as time progresses, we have the third layer of amino acids, which is just one type of amino acid that basically elutes, and we get this peak number one. Then the second layer elutes a certain time after we have the second peak, and a third one elutes, we have the third peak. So because this is the highest, we have a greater proportion of these types of amino acids. And because this is the smallest, we have the least proportion. And so this graph gives us the ratio of our amino acids, one to the other one. And in this manner, we can basically determine what the composition of our protein is.